สวัสดีครับเดี๋ยวเราเริ่มกันเลยนะครับแต่ว่าเดี๋ยวผมอินโทรให้ก่อนนะครับคือ <coughs> วันนี้ที่เรามาฟังกันเนี่ยคือ,อทุกคนทราบอยู่แล้วว่านี่เป็นเวิร์กช็อปจากของโรงเรียนอีสตานะครับ International School of Creative Art นะครับซึ่งวันนี้คนที่มาเนี่ยชื่อมิสเตอร์คอลินเทริแกนนะครับซึ่งเป็น Executive Director ของที่โรงเรียนนี้แต่ก่อนที่เราจะเริ่มเนี่ยผมอยากเกริ่นนิดนึงว่าทําไมวันนี้เรื่องที่เราจะมาคุยกันเนี่ยมันถึงมีความสําคัญมากๆนะครับผมขอย้อนกลับไปเมื่อสักประมาณ12ปีที่แล้ว12ปีที่แล้วเนี่ยก็ปี2011ตอนนั้นเนี่ยผมกับครูตู่นะครับเราเดินทางไปที่อังกฤษความตั้งใจหนึ่งของเราตอนนั้นเนี่ยเราตั้งใจจะไปขอทาง UAL University of the Art London เพื่อขอให้หมวดอาร์ตของเราเนี่ยตัวอาร์ตแอนด์ดีไซน์ที่เราทำเนี่ยได้รับการแอคเครดิตโปรแกรมของ UAL เพื่อให้สามารถส่งเด็กเนี่ยเข้าอยู่ที่ UAL ได้คราวนี้ในการไปประชุมที่ UAL ครั้งนั้นเนี่ยเราก็เจอคอมมิตี้เยอะเลยนะครับแล้วก็มีคุณคอลินอยู่ในนั้นด้วยในการพูดคุยวันนั้นเนี่ยจริงๆทุกอย่างเนี่ยเป็นไปได้อย่างดีมากๆแต่ว่าปัญหาเนี่ยมันมีอยู่ปัญหาเดียวก็คือณตอนนั้นเนี่ย UAL เนี่ยเขายังไม่แอคเครดิตโปรแกรมออกมานอกประเทศอังกฤษเพราะฉะนั้นในวันนั้นน่ะสิ่งที่เราไปขอเนี่ยมันเป็นสิ่งที่ไม่สามารถทําได้คราวนี้พอการประชุมออกมาอย่างนั้นเนี่ยตอนแรกผมกับครูตู่ก็คิดว่าเออคงไม่ได้อะไรละเดี๋ยววันรุ่งขึ้นก็กลับเมืองไทยละปรากฏว่าคุณคอลินเนี่ยเดินออกมาตามหลังมาแล้วบอกว่าปองครูตูอยู่มีเวลาว่างอีกสักวันหนึ่งไหมพรุ่งนี้ไปเยี่ยมโรงเรียนไอหน่อยไอทําโรงเรียนเอเลเวลแต่เป็นโรงเรียนเอเลเวลที่โฟกัสด้านอาร์ตถ้ามีเวลาเนี่ยลองไปดูหน่อยเผื่อมันจะเป็นทางเลือกอีกอย่างหนึ่งให้กับเด็กของคุณได้อ่าเราก็เลยตัดสินใจโอเคเพิ่มโปรแกรมนี้เข้าไปแล้วก็ไปดูนะครับเราได้ไปดูโรงเรียนโรงเรียนหนึ่งที่ตอนแรกเนี่ยเราเดินทางเข้าไปเนี่ยเรามีความกังวลนิดหน่อยเพราะว่าเฮ้ยมันอยู่ในป่าคือมันอยู่ในป่าจริงๆคือเดินทางไปเนี่ยมันโอ้โหมันเข้าเข้าป่าเข้าป่าไปสักพักหนึ่งเฮ้ยมีต้นไม้มีอะไรแยกเต็ไมไปหมดเลยแต่พอเราไปถึงที่ตรงนั้นเนี่ยมันเป็นที่ที่ environment เนี่ยมันเหมาะสมกับการเรียนรู้มากๆพอขึ้นชื่อว่าเป็น art school เนี่ยแน่นอนครับว่ามันมีมีมันมี boarding มี facility มีที่พักเนี่ยตั้งอยู่ตรงนั้นแหละแต่ตัวโรงเรียนเนี่ยมันคือ workshop 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 เนี่ยต่อกันเป็นแถวยาวๆอันนึงเป็น fine art อันนึงเป็น graphic อันนึงเป็นเท็กซ์ทายอันนึงเป็น 3D อันนึงเป็นโฟโต้เรียงกันอย่างนั้นนะซึ่งสิ่งที่เราเข้าไปเห็นเนี่ยถ้าใครเกิดมาเพื่อจะเรียนอาร์ตอ่ะมันต้องโรงเรียนนี้เท่านั้นละมันต้องเรียนนี้เท่านั้นเพราะว่าในแต่ละห้องเนี่ยมันคือนั่งทําอาร์ตกันอย่างเดียวเลยมีแต่คนทําอาร์ตมีแต่คนคุยกันเรื่องอาร์ตแล้วโฟกัสแต่อาร์ตอย่างเดียวซึ่งวันนั้นที่เราไปเห็นเนี่ยตอนแรกเนี่ยเราว่าเฮ้ยงั้นในเรื่องทํำฟาวเดชันในเมืองไทยเนี่ยเอาแอคคริทโปรแกรมของ UAL กลับมาเนี่ยเราพักไว้ก่อนก็ได้ถ้าเกิดเรามีเด็กคนหนึ่งที่สนใจด้านอาร์ตแล้วแบบอยากเรียนอาร์ตจริงๆเนี่ยเราส่งมาที่นี่ก่อนก็ได้ตอนแรกเราก็คิดว่ามันจะเป็นแค่นั้นเพราะว่าเราเจอเซอร์ไพรส์มากกว่านั้นหลังจากที่เราคุยกันวันนั้นเนี่ยเราเจอว่าสิ่งที่เอสกาเนี่ยนะสิ่งที่เอสกาเนี่ยเขามีมากกว่าโรงเรียนอื่นๆเนี่ยก็คือปกติเนี่ยถ้าเราพูดถึง UAL ครับ University of the Art London เนี่ยมันจะมีคอลเลจหลายคอลเลจแล้วหนึ่งในคอลเลจที่ดังที่สุดเนี่ยคือเซนทรัลเซนต์มาตินหรือ CSM ซึ่งอันนี้เป็นที่ที่คนอยากเข้ามากที่สุดแต่สิ่งที่เป็นปัญหาของ CSM ก็คือเวลาเราเรียนจบ A level หรือเรียนจบ IB แล้วเนี่ยสปีที่เราเรียนเนี่ยเราไม่สามารถเข้าปีหนึ่งของเซนทรัลเซนต์มาตินได้ไม่ว่าเราจะมีผลงานอาร์ตดีแค่ไหนหรือเกรดเป็นยังไงก็ตามพอเขาถือว่าพอร์ตโฟลิโอของเราเนี่ยอยู่ในระดับที่ต่ําเกินไปเราต้องไปเรียนซ้ํา Foundation in Art and Design 1ปีเราถึงจะสามารถเข้าไปเรียนปีหนึ่งที่เซนต์มาตินได้แต่สิ่งที่อิสกาทําได้คือเขาเป็นโรงเรียนอาร์ต A level ที่1ก่อตั้งจากทีมครูของ UAL อันที่2คือครูปัจจุบันที่อยู่เนี่ยก็ยังเป็นครูที่มาจาก UAL เพราะนั้นสิ่งที่เขาทำเนี่ย A level ปีแรกเนี่ยเรียน A level ปกติแต่ A level ปีที่2เนี่ยทุกอาทิตย์เราจะได้ไปเรียนที่เซนทรัลเซนต์มาตินแล้วพอเราไปเรียนที่เซนทรัลเซนต์มาตินทุกอาทิตย์เนี่ยพอร์ตโฟลิโอของเราเนี่ยมันจะพัฒนาขึ้นไปเรื่อยๆจนถึงวันหนึ่งเนี่ยเราจะมีโปรไฟล์ที่ดีพอที่สุดท้ายเนี่ยเราไปทำเวิร์กช็อปทำกิจกรรมเพิ่มช่วงซัมเมอร์อีกนิดหน่อยเนี่ยเราสามารถเข้าปีหนึ่งของเซนต์มาตินได้
การเรียนอาร์ตจริงๆเนี่ยมันเป็นยังไงวิธีคิดของอาร์ติสเนี่ยเป็นยังไงแล้วตรงนี้จะเป็นตัวที่เราสามารถเอามาช่วยคิดได้ว่าเราเนี่ยเหมาะกับการเรียนอาร์ตแอนด์ดีไซน์มากแค่ไหนเราเหมาะกับการเรียนไปเรียนอาร์ติสก้าไหมเราเหมาะกับการไปเรียน U L ไหมหรือเราเหมาะกับการที่จะมีแคเรียนที่เกี่ยวข้องกับอาร์ติสไหมนะครับตรงนี้ที่ผมจะพูดมีแค่นี้ละเดี๋ยวผมขอยกเวทีตรงนี้ให้กับคุณคอรินในการแนะนําเรื่องเกี่ยวกับอีสก้าแล้วก็เริ่มทําเวิร์กช็อปกันสำหรับวันนี้นะครับขอบคุณครับโอเคคอรินจูเกตสตาร์ทเลยครับโอเค welcome to everyone I'm delighted to be here again is everyone okay with my English okay and I'll obviously if I'm going too quickly let me know so just to say delighted to be here I've been associated with uh, this school 20-25 years, a long time. And first of all, in my role when I was at University of the Arts London, where I was a di deputy director of the International and a teaching member of staff at a college called Central St. Martin's College. And I did that for many years. Then a few years ago, from 2009-2010, still at the university, I established this school, ISCA. And then in 2013, gave my role up at the university and worked as the executive director at ISCA. And in many ways, we still have a very strong link. My students link with Central St. Martins in the second year of their A-level, one day a week. We have very strong friendship together with University of the Arts and Central St. Martins. But what I'd like to do today is to do two things. One is quite briefly to introduce the school. And then secondly, to give an example of the way that we develop ideas at ISCA. So we'll be doing a concept development session. A concept development session will be about branding. We'll be thinking of branding from a Bangkok point of view. And what we'll focus on is a group in teams within the group is how we would develop, if we're asked to, to develop Bangkok as a global brand. How can we reinvent Bangkok to become a global brand? So this workshop will emphasize conceptual development, the development of ideas. But before we do that, I'm going to give you just a quick overview of ISCA. I set ISCA up a number of years ago when I was still at the university because I felt there was a gap in the market. There was a gap in the market, the way we teach in the UK, and the way many countries, particularly in Asia, teach art and design. And as we go through this presentation, you'll see that at ISCA, we have a very particular, I'm just wondering, am I getting this wrong to turn it? Is it that one? Yes. We have a very particular way of teaching art and design. So I'll go into that in a moment. But the first thing to say, it was established when I was still at University of the Arts London. Now it's independent. I own the school. But what is so unique about ISCA is that we have a track record of tremendous success. You'll see on the list here, 100% of our students get top university places. And the reason they get top university places is because we have small groups and we work very intensely with our students. We work very intensely preparing their portfolios and their thinking for top universities in line with what top universities expect. You'll see here all the places that my students get offered. Not one place, but some students getting several offers at several really good universities. So you see the list of names at the side and all the university places they're offered. That was last year. So real really big success track record of success and for a number of reasons we are successful my tutors have my experience and the experience is we we both understand university education and we understand high school education and what the link is between high school and university many international schools in art and design don't really understand the link between the high school and the university. My teachers do, because many of them are taught at university, and we understand the requirements. So specialist tutors is a key thing. And the other key is the way we emphasize with our teaching. And we'll be showing this this afternoon. We believe in student-centered teaching. 
What does that mean? It means that we see students as individuals. And we think it's really important in art and design to rec realize our students are individuals. So that we build the strengths of our students. All of the students have different strengths and maybe different weaknesses. Some students we have are really, really good at drawing. Some students are incredibly creative, aren't so good at drawing. Some students are really good at concepts. Other students are really good at managing design process. So we recognize that all students are different and we approach the teaching, we call it in a blended way. So we recognize strengths and weaknesses to build up the strengths and weaknesses so that they can ultimately be successful when they apply for top universities. This is what the school offers, the list of courses here. We go from a pre-A level course at the age of 15 through to a two-year A level course, which is unique, the A level course, because in year two of the A-level, all students have the opportunity of studying at Central St. Martins for one day a week. And we think it's really important because my school is very small and Central St. Martins is the biggest art school in the UK. So they all have experience during the time of the A-level of being a university student for one day a week. So we bridge the gap between school and university. Some students come on the portfolio programme, that's quite an important course because a number of students go to international schools in different countries and it doesn't work for them. It doesn't work because, not because the curriculum isn't good, it's because the teachers aren't always qualified to prepare portfolios. So some of them will leave their international school and come to the UK to ISCA to develop their portfolio. That's where we've had this strong relationship with Crew 2 Homeschool over the years. We have a same philosophy. We believe in this approach that's process-based. It's the journey to the product rather than just making products. And it's the journey to the product via the portfolio, showing the student's creative development. So that portfolio development course is really important. We have online tutorials. We have an online program of tutorials. We have the CAP Summer School and most recently we've developed the one-year foundation diploma for those students who finished A-level or IB and want to prepare for university externally online. We have a number of students who want to do that, particularly those mature students who want to return to learning. We have some students who've done degree courses in Thailand or Japan or Korea redo the foundation course with us online to go to university in London. So we have a full complement of courses here. The course that really is popular for many Thai students is the, the CAP, the summer program. And by the looks of it this year, we're going to have a lot of students from all over the world coming on the summer program. We not just get a taste of the way we teach at ISCA, you also get an exposure to London, creative London. The art galleries, the museums, the universities, going to the theatre, going to all of the creative activities there. So those are the courses. And these are the subjects we teach. We teach all aspects of fine art, all aspects of graphic design, from illustration to graphic, uh, computer graphics to communication graphics to book art, all the subjects of fashion textiles. That is our most popular subject, fashion and textiles. It's the most growing subject in the world. Second only to communication design. That's another growing subject. We have 3D design, which is architecture, product design, jewellery, interior design, all the range of 3D design. Academic subjects, we teach art history, critical and contextual studies, mathematics and English. And so we have a full complement of subjects. And then we've got here the slide here showing the one day a week at Central St. Martins doing the creative practice course. And by doing that, it means that at the end of that, if you decide to apply to University of the Arts courses, you have a shortened foundation course. It's, we call it FAD Plus, 13 weeks in London during the summer holiday after A-level prior to going on the degree course. So you save a year of study. And that is the FAD Plus. And this shows the Creative uh, Arts Summer Camp, all the different activities which is both academic and enjoyable fun.
and this is our campus. We share our campus with a very beautiful Japanese school. It's in a lovely location near to Heathrow Airport, very safe, very beautiful, with all the four modern facilities with gymnasium, swimming pool, tennis courts, football pitches, all of the things that a campus should have. This now shows a range of our work. How do we teach? How do we teach art design? We teach art design in a very, very particular way. We think all of our students are going to be taught from us art and design for life. So what we do, we make sure that all students have that full range of transferable skills. What are these transferable skills? One of the key transferable skills is the ability to do what I'm doing now, communicate. So we teach all of our students that communication skills are really important. Communication in writing, communication in speaking, presenting, and communication through visual, so you can draw. You can draw and understand the visual world, whether you're going to be an architect or a fashion designer or a fine artist. You understand the visual world. And you can write competently. You can write competently so people understand what your ideas are about. You can present in front of a group with confidence. So all the way through ISCA, we're focusing on that broad range of communication skills. In addition to that, we're saying at ISCA, where do ideas come from? What are concepts? Where do you get concepts from? Where do you get concepts from to be an architect? to be an interior designer, to be a fashion designer, to be an artist. Where do they come from? We teach you the research skills to develop concepts and to work through a range of different ideas where you test out your concepts, to test out the viability of a concept. So in all of the subject, concept is right at the heart of it. What's another transferable skill? Another one is critical thinking to be critical. That doesn't mean you criticize people. It means that you're able to have discussions in an objective way. I can talk about your work, you can talk about my work in a clear, objective, not subjective way. So we're not discussing the work from an emotional point of view, where I'm saying, I don't like your work because I don't like you. We're not doing that. We're saying, some of your work needs improvement, even though I really like you. But let's talk together on how we can improve the work. We're always being objective. So we teach critical thinking to look at problems 360 degrees in that objective way. What else do we do for transferable skills? What's really important? It's that ability to think around a problem to understand a broad understanding of a subject. And we call that context. Context. To understand the context of the situation. What are the contexts that young people or the world is in now? What is the big, what's the contextual understanding of our world? What do people really need to understand if they're living now in 2023? You'd say one of the big contexts is the environment. The environment's affecting all of us, isn't it? For three years, COVID affected all of us. What else is affecting us? Sustainability. Using materials so we're not wasting materials. Energy shortages, there's a big context. So we teach our students contextual understanding. How do we teach that in art design? We teach it in a relevant way in art design. We would say, like the French Impressionists, think of those French Impressionists. Those of you doing art and design will know those French Impressionists. Monet, Cézanne, Van Gogh. Those really important 19th century French artists. What was the context of the way they were living then? The context was that France had had a revolution. France had changed. It was different from Britain. We didn't have a revolution. They got rid of the monarchy. The, so that when you look at the French Impressionist paintings, they're different from British painting at that time. The French are painting in the Impressionist ordinary people, doing ordinary things. 
in ordinary situations. They weren't painting lords and ladies and kings and queens. They're painting ordinary people. So the context was revolution. What else was the context at that time? They're painting quickly, weren't they? Painting quickly with a sort of a bright palette because photography had been invented. Technology was influencing the context whilst you could click, take a photograph quickly. So the painters had to adjust the way they worked. They weren't painting like a photograph. They're painting in a more slightly abstract way. What else was the context of the 19th century? The advent of machine. They were going through the landscape on trains. Suddenly the machine was taking us along. Not horses, not carriages, trains. The Industrial Revolution had happened. We're coming towards having motor cars. Looking through the window of a car, seeing the landscape changing. So the context had changed. So what we do at ISCA, we teach our students not just to understand the subject, we teach them that all the things that are happening around the subject. There's a beautiful old-fashioned phrase at British universities that say, to read your subject, if you're a mathematician or a scientist or an artist, to read your subject, you read around the subject. Not just reading the subject. You read all of those things that influence the subject. And by reading the things that influence the subject, you get a much broader understanding of the subject. So this is the range of work at ISCA. And I'm, rich, I'm going through it quite quickly, so I want to start our workshop. I want us to get involved in this creative workshop. So that shows all the breadth of work with an emphasis on process. As we go through a process and experimentation. Why is process important? Process means that you're working through a series of ideas before the end product. Process is important because we would say it gives you a chance to change your mind. It gives you a chance to be more original rather than cliche, not just jumping to the end. Trying through experiment, trying new ways of material, new ways of thinking, new ways of working. So your thinking and your doing are catching up with each other. So this, all this work shows process. Look at all of these experimental fashion design and experimental materials, experimental photography and lighting, giving a very broad understanding of the subject. Now, we're going to very quickly switch to our workshop. And if you read the workshop, rebrand Bangkok as a global city. What does that mean? What is a global city? I would say London is a global city. I would say I used to live in America. I would say New York is a global city. There aren't many global cities around. But London, New York, very important global cities. Paris, quite almost a global city. Not quite, but almost. In Asia, not Tokyo, but I would have said Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a global city. Tokyo is very much a Japanese city with some international influences, but not global. But Hong Kong is, was more so in the past a global city. What, what is a global city? So that's the first question. We'll come back to that in a moment. Let me just think of, we'll think of what branding can do there. First of all, then we're going to come back. What is a global city? Branding is really powerful. The way you can brand a product or brand a place. Very it makes people think differently about the place or the product. I was um, fortunate enough to live in New York in the 1980s. And I was studying in America. I was doing my MA. New York in the 1980s, at the beginning of the 1980s, was terrible. It was awful. Exciting art galleries, but a terrible place. Crime was everywhere. Drug taking everywhere. The city was falling apart. It had run out of money. Everywhere you went, you're in gridlock. You couldn't move. And then, 
the people that cared about New York thought about rebranding New York. We must get money in, but we've got to rebrand. We've got to change people's views about New York. And apart from getting finance in, they were actively changing people's view of New York. They did the most amazing marketing campaign. Some of, if there are any older people here, you may remember it. And they chose Hollywood greats, the big names from Hollywood. And they'd come in front of the camera and they'd go like this, they'd say, bite an apple. I love New York. I was it? I love New York, said Arnie Schwarzenegger. I love New York, with a tattered leather jacket on and jeans. I love this place. And it gave the most amazing image, the most amazing identity of New York. What it said was many things, but it said, to live in New York, you need to be tough. It's not a beautiful place, it's a tough place. You have a strong character like Arnie Schwarzenegger. And all of the Hollywood greats were doing it. <coughs> Love New York. And the advertising went in line with the reinvestment. And it was brilliant because it became fashionable to like a tough, rough, and ready city. It became fashionable. I'm tough. I like New York. I don't go to New York to relax. I go to New York so I can deal with it. It changed the thinking about New York. In the 1990s, I was really lucky to live in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. And I used to come a lot to Bangkok, but I lived in Malaysia. Malaysia had a different problem from New York. Malaysia wanted to be more international. And they wanted to get lots of tourists in. And I worked with... Um, there was a Prime Minister in Malaysia then called Prime Minister Mahathir. And I worked with his daughter, Marina Mahathir. Very nice lady. Very bright. And they worked on how to make Malaysia more tourist friendly. And they got brilliant people in to rebrand Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. And they still use the same brand now. And you know that brand where they said, Malaysia truly Asia, Malaysia truly Asia, and all the images behind, brilliant, brilliant images. They showed beautiful Asian people, Chinese, Malay, Indian, Eurasians, with a backdrop of old fashioned Malaysia, eating out of doors in the sunshine, eating in posh restaurants with the twin towers behind. Malaysia truly Asia is both traditional multicultural, friendly, and looking to the future. What a brand. What a branding that was. Malaysia Truly Asia. So that was two examples of branding a city, cities and changing the view. So people on a wet Sunday afternoon in London, watching the TV, called. It's January. Where are we going to go for our summer holidays? Why don't we go to Malaysia? It's warm. It's friendly. There's all this great food and, and nice places to go to. It's a tremendous success, the branding. Branding is so powerful. There was another rebranding in the 1990s, and I see someone's wearing Burberry. The rebranding of Burberry. You know Burberry. Very big brand, it was rebranded. Burberry used to be, everywhere you looked, check. Check. I hated it. I hated Burberry. Because all it was is checks. And it was an old fashioned, tired brand. And Burberry had to reinvent itself. It had to reinvent itself to become a modern looking brand. How could it reinvent itself? They got a new head of marketing. And this new head of marketing did a brilliant thing. Head of marketing said, hide the check. Hide the check so you can't see the check. Ah, oh, the check is there. It's there. The check is here. The check is there. But no checks outside. The check was underneath. It's concealed underneath. And it was a brilliant way of doing it. 
Find the check. Where is the check? Oh, it's there. But it's hidden. Oh, where is it? Oh, it's there. But it wasn't just everywhere. So this is a product reinventing itself. And it's actually inspired lots of other brands. So with products, you can really look at branding to change it. So the word and the images can make change your point of view. Have we all heard of the Renault car? The French car Renault. Very popular brand in Europe and very popular in parts of the world, Renault. And Renault worked with, um, they came to give lectures at my college, Central St. Martins. The Renault designer who reinvented Renault. And in the 1990s, the Renault designer said he was brought in because Renault sales were plummeting. Because they'd done the biggest mistake they lost the Frenchness. They tried to compete with Japan and made an international car that didn't look French. It looked, oh, it could be Japanese. It could be Korean. But it didn't look French. So when he came in, he rebranded Renault to be French again. He made it the most French-looking car you could imagine. So what, does, what is French? What, what, mean, what does French mean? He took a walk along the River Seine in Paris, that beautiful river walk, and all of the beautiful lights, the Art Nouveau lights, beautifully decorated lights along the river. And when he designed the car for Renault, he brought those lights, the headlamps, into the Renault car. So the light from the River Seine became the look of the lights for Renault cars. He went to look at the Impressionist paintings in the Louvre, all of those beautiful Monet painting. And through computer extraction, computer-aided design, he took those paintings and he analyzed the colors and the freshness of them. And he brought them inside the Renault car. So when you get inside the Renault car, I'm inside a Monet painting. I'm inside a French Impressionist painting. All the colors of the fabric all the colours of the interior, all the freshness and brightness of a French painting. He did a final thing. He said, what do the French like most of all? What do the French like most of all? They strut. They show off. French people walk in a particular way. They show off, particularly French women. I'm French. I walk in a particular way. I'm proud. And he looked at French women and the way French women walk. Boom, 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 boom. And as they walk away and their legs are moving and they look at them at the back. And he created the back of the Renault to look like a, the shape of a beautiful French woman as she's walking away. So he got the female body into that. He made it into a female car that's friendly and feminine to both women and to men. So it's not just he made it French and the sales started to go up because it looked different. Fiat copied it, the Italian car Fiat copied and did it beautifully. They made the Fiat cars female friendly. Fiat cars are beautiful for women. Everything's rounded and soft and comfortable. Many women I know love Fiat cars. They love them because it's not designed the way men like cars. Everything's sharp and angular. It's soft and beautiful. And the sound of the engine is female. But they designed it for women in mind. So the branding is powerful. So coming back to our original question. What does it mean to be a global brand, Bangkok? What does it mean to be a global city? What do you have to embrace if you want to be a global city? What's the first thing you embrace? In London, we're always changing. Always changing. It's a global city, it changes. People from all over the world live in London. People from all over the world bring their cultures with them in London. Their food, their colours, their smells, their designs. So London is always reinventing itself. New York is the same, it's always reinventing itself. 
because all the people who come from all of the different parts of the world change it. So the first thing you have to think if you want to be a global city is you have to be willing to change. It's really important. Dynamic means change. You have to change. So when I talk to people and they come to my city in London, they say, so what is typically British? There's lots of typically British things. However, the definition of being British is changing all the time. So you have to say, I'm okay with change. If I'm not okay with change, I can't be global. If I say, we have to have this food, in this style, with this design, you're not, you couldn't be a global city because your mind is fixed. If you say, I throw the cards up and I look at culture in a different way. Culture is living, culture is breathing, it's changing. And because it's changing and reinventing itself, the global city keeps changing and reinventing itself. So how would we make Bangkok into a global city? What would we need to do? The first thing I think is to embrace change. You have to say, can't just be fixed. You have to embrace change. When I go to Japan, I love Tokyo, but Tokyo doesn't change very much. It's Japanese. Tokyo is clearly a massive city, but Japanese. Japanese culture, Japanese food, Japanese everything and it's fixed. That's what stop it being a global city in my definition because it's a Japanese, beautiful Japanese city. It's not a global city. Everyone wouldn't feel comfortable in Tokyo because it's Japanese. So you have to conform to it being Japanese. So if we say Bangkok becomes a global city, we have to embrace change. Let me have some ideas from some of you before we get some ideas on paper. What would you, if you want to be a global city, what would you change? Anyone, just give me an idea. What could you change? What would you, where would you embrace change? I'm going to ask you. Me? Yeah. Still thinking. Okay, but give me some ideas. What would you, what would you bring change to be? Give me some ideas. What would the change be if you're going to make Japan, if you're going to make Bangkok a global city? And we're saying it is embraced. It's got to embrace change. What would be the changes that would uh, bring about the global city change? What could it be? What injects different sort of ideas and different life into a city to become a global city? We can rebrand Bangkok and we can say, what's the brand mean? But we're saying, let's change the brand of, brand of Bangkok. How can we change it? Malaysia, truly Asia. That's not global, but it's an Asian city. How could we, what would be the embracing change in Bangkok? What could the change be? We don't want to ruin things that we love. We want to keep the things that we cherish and we love. We want to show there's something dynamic and changing. How could we change it? Have any of you heard of a, an awful city in America called Cleveland? Not a great city. It's quite an ugly, it was quite an ugly city, Cleveland. Very depressing city. They changed the brand of Cleveland in a very simple way. They said, to change the brand of Cleveland, we've got to attract investment. And to attract investment and richer people, we need to put into place a layer of culture that richer people want to enjoy. So the first thing they did, they made a world-class orchestra. It's world-class, beautiful orchestra, brilliant orchestra. So richer people can go to concerts and have world-class musicians there. They made world-class schools and world-class museums and exhibition areas. So there's lots of culture and theatre. And slowly but surely, they change Cleveland by, cha by having a cultural base. So how could we make Bangkok into a more global city? 
What sort of things could we do to make it more global? We could have global events. Global events, couldn't we? What would be a really wonderful global event to put Bangkok on the map? We could have major cultural global events, couldn't we? And we could show off the best of what Bangkok is. And as a foreigner, what I like about Bangkok is I love the sense of all of the old history. I love the old history. I love the fact there is a skyscraper and a temple next door. I like the contrast of the old and the new. So I could think of cultural events which show the, showcase the old artistic culture of Bangkok or Thailand, but we bring in modern art as well, or modern design. So we could showcase the contrast of new with old. What else could we do? We could bring culture in. What other global events could we have? What else can we really show that is wonderful with Bangkok? I'm sorry? The street, food the street food is wonderful in Bangkok, isn't it? The atmosphere. The street food and atmosphere. But how can we make it more global? What could we do to make it global? We can show it off, but how do we make it global? Exactly. What a great idea that would be. That's what we've done in London. There are streets in London or as you walk along the street, there's every food from every part of the world. So as you're walking along, you can buy food with Argentinian meat. Oh, I can buy some Thai food. I can buy some Chinese food. I can buy street food from all over the world. So we have several streets in, in London that bring the world into those streets. So that people from all over the world, we have millions of tourists in London, feel at home. Ah, I feel really good, I'm at home. So we can actually... That's a really good idea. Any more ideas? How can we globalize? I think to show an old way of eating in the street, street food, but make it global. Really good idea. Any other ideas? How about this time? I think it would be brilliant. Who said that? I absolutely agree with you. Thai textiles are beautiful. They are beautiful. Let's showcase them to the world. But then we could invite other countries to showcase their textiles. What's so beautiful about Thai textiles? You tell me. Yeah. Cotton and silk are beautiful. The textures are so beautiful, aren't they? It's unique. Yeah. It's unique with texture. Right. Unique with colour and unique with the weaving, the, the construction of it. So let's show it off. But with them bringing textiles from other places too, to, to show what it's like. Because our textile is very, very unique because it's handmade. It's handmade. Yes. Yeah. And that would, that's the strength of it, because there'll always be a market for handmade things. Great idea. So events were around textiles. What else? And many ideas. I think global events, textiles, food, many ways. If I say to you now, if, if you're going to divide, can we divide into small groups with some paper and just note down some ideas? Would you, we work in little groups so you can share some ideas. Should we divide into, say, five groups? Could, we, could the crew, crew to homeschool staff help divide quickly with some notes, some paper? And all I want is just a list of ideas. How we'd make it global. What could those things be? Textiles, I think, are good. Food is good. I think big artistic events would be good. So just divide up into how many of you are there here. Can we divide into five groups? Yeah, please.